go. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling.
Good morning. Good morning and uh, welcome to Olive Church. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to see everyone here this morning. Uh, we are going to be continuing our series, Rethinking the Church. And our scripture today comes from uh, the book of Galatians, where Paul is uh, addressing some concerns and some issues that ar- arised, uh, or arose, arised, uh, arose, from his first missionary trip. Am I accurate on that, Jason? Okay. So, uh, in Paul's time, the, the issue uh, sounded like a lot was circumcision. We don't maybe deal with that as much, uh, that particular topic, but we obviously deal with all kinds of other topics in the church. And so what Paul is talking about in this scripture is bearing one another's burdens. In fact, in my Bible, I I looked it up in a couple different translations. Um, In in one of them, the title of this section of scripture was titled, We Reap What We Sow. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Like, that's a concept that even people who don't attend church or even people out in the secular world, they can understand that, right? You reap what you sow, whether we're talking financially, whether we're talking, um, you know, I was, I was watching you guys with your instruments. Obviously, that skill didn't develop overnight. You put time into it, um, and now you're reaping those benefits. Um, there's a lot of things like that. But I think what Paul's really getting at in this scripture is the hearts and minds of people, And when you put in the time into relationships, into scripture, into your prayer life, into those types of things, you can get a whole lot of benefit back. And so I just, uh, this morning as we start our service, I encourage you to think about what you're reaping uh, and sowing throughout the week. And what are we as a a whole church, as a church body, what are we sowing and reaping uh, here at Olive? So uh, please join me in prayer as we open our service, and then I'll turn it back over to the music. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful to be here in front of your church body here at Olive. I'm so thankful for each person that is here and for those that are watching on the uh, live stream. Lord, I just uh, thank you so very much for this congregation. Uh, We, Lord, are the hands and feet. We carry out the work that you call us to do. And so, Lord, I just pray that the service this morning would be a blessing to you, but also a blessing to us and an encouragement as we go out in the world. Help us to recognize burdens when we see them, and help us to be the light in people's lives that help them carry those burdens. And Lord, when those burdens get to be so big, help us to lean on you and to bring them to you at the cross, knowing that your work is finished and that you are here to help us and love us and offer a path to salvation. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand and join us in singing. Jesus, you are mine. 
You know, it doesn't really matter if it's been the last two years of absolute chaos and weirdness or if it's been an entire lifetime, say 36 years of weirdness. God always finds a way, doesn't he? Always. And that's promised to us. And when we doubt that, I, I just don't get it. And I do it myself, but I don't get it. Is he always finds a way. The battle belongs to him. When we see a, a, a mountain, he sees it moved already. When he sees what we're about to fight, he already sees the outcome where he's victorious and we're victorious through him. Amen. When all I see is a battle you see my victory yeah. when all i see is a mountain you see a mountain moved and as i walk through the shadow your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, in every field.
Our scripture this morning is Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. When I first read this a couple days ago on the church email, I thought, wow, these are pretty strong and direct words coming from Paul. So, see what words stand out to you as I read this scripture. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to anyone else. For each one should carry their own load. Please join me in a prayer for Pastor Jason uh, before he gives today's sermon. Heavenly Father, I am so very thankful for Jason and for the role he plays at our church. He is many things to many different people, but right now in this place and in this moment, he is our pastor here at Olive, and as he delivers today's message, Lord, may you just give him the words that he needs to say and the clarity of mind uh, to say them uh, to us. Lord, please bless Jason and bless this congregation as we listen to your message. Amen. Thank you, Seth, and thank you, praise team. Um, good morning. It's wonderful to be with you all this morning. Wonderful to have you all here. Um, and for those who are in person or just joining us or are joining us online for the first time or, or maybe in a bit, we are in this series, like Seth said, called Rethinking the Church, where we're looking at some different spaces that um, we might have, and, and deep down, we might know that these are, are, are the, the right thoughts, but church as a whole is maybe has some perspective shifts uh, that, we're, that we're, we're looking at with this. So, so far, we've, we've looked at the definition of church as not being constricted by the walls of a building uh, and the inability of a building to move, but the church being the people, right? We know this, forming a body. Uh, with its many parts designed to work together to, to maintain in a healthy way. And just like a physical body, when it's maintained in a healthy way, it's designed to work and move efficiently and with a purpose and intention. And for us as a church body, that is to, to share the gospel to the world around us, not just with the people within our building. <clears throat> And last week we looked at one of the spaces in which we can build our body in a healthy way by looking at the example that Paul gave of, of flipping the perspective of, of persecutions and troubles and trauma, tension, or, or whatever the negative might be that's coming our way, by flipping it um, to looking at it as a ministry opportunity, not something that's just out to get us. And with the people or the person behind the troubles, uh, not as people who are out to get us, not as people we need to stay separated from, but people who are now ministry targets. Anyone come to mind for you? And when we respond in this way to these situations and, and to people in this way, then we can look back at our response Whatever the situation, when, however far down the line it takes to get through it, and we can know that we came through it in a pure and blameless way. Not adding to the sin problem, <clears throat> excuse me, but by paving the way for grace and for restoration that comes through the gospel message of Jesus Christ. This is a much better place to live. And people will see us. And they will know that our testimony, they will know that our lives, that our story is being written in a different way. Today we're going to look at a, a space that's maybe a bit more personal. Like last week, you know, the, the troubles and the turmoils, that can even be seen as, as a whole body thing sometimes, right? 
Well, today we're going to be looking at this idea of accountability and individualism. Individualism is a space that the world right now, and, and maybe historically, tells us that we should embrace. To hold on to who we are at all costs. And accountability is a space the world tells us we should defend against. A space to stay out of because the world has uh, said it's a place of offense. A space the world has taught us to question with, with a simple question like, who are you to call me out? Are you superior to me? Are you holier than me? You're acting self-righteous when you yourself are just as messed up as I am. You don't have the right to hold me accountable. Yet at the same time, we can see it's easy for us to see spaces where accountability can be handy and helpful, right? We can see it in other people where if, if someone had held them accountable or, or called them out on something or, or encouraged them in a different way, it could have helped their life end up a little different, right? And we know it for ourselves personally too, where we've had people speak into us and, and call us to live in a different way. We know that this idea of accountability is helpful, but we don't dare go there because of the thoughts we just mentioned and if we might go there with someone else, it, it kind of opens the door for someone else to hold us accountable. And in, in the areas that I struggle with, and well, <laughs> that gets uncomfortable. <laughs> and who would they be anyway to raise questions about my life? So, we stay in our own lane. Because their business is their business, and my business is my business. And we hesitate to reach out and ask for someone else to hold us accountable. Because that, that might mean maybe we're not doing it on our own. Or, or maybe it means we're messing up, or we have places that we need held accountable. Or because it means we need to share deeper with someone. And that gets a little uncomfortable, and that can get a little bit scary, right? Because you never truly, fully know that the information you're sharing with someone is really going to be safe with that person. And so we become a world of individuals. We become a church of individuals. Living our own lives, staying in our own lane, developing shallow relationships, playing nice on Sundays and going back to the same old routines of life the rest of the week. Motivated to hold our tough stuff close. Motivated to, make, motivated to make our shell look good and happy and everything's dandy. Even though inside we know we could use someone to lift us up. We benefit from someone to know us a little bit deeper. At least this is me. Might be for some of you too. I don't know. And then there's the church's role in accountability. It's been done many ways, historically. You know, there's the old church confessional system. Done in secret. Come back as many times as needed. Your sins are forgiven. Free pass, right? There's the front of the church accountability. This might be one some of us are familiar with, depending on the churches that we grew up in. Where if you take something or share something with a church leader, then uh, you might get asked to confess it in front of the whole church. A method that encourages good behavior through the fear of public humiliation. Don't think that's the way... Christ wants good behavior to come out. I think he wants more of the changed hearts method makes good behavior, right? And there's the accountability that, you know, we just, that isn't really accountability at all, where we just try to pretend that everything is okay with everyone. 
And if something was wrong with someone, we assume that they're talking with somebody or they would go talk to somebody. And we think everybody's following Jesus 100%. And because of this, or at least because we tell ourselves this, we look the other way for things, right? And maybe for some of the areas, reasons listed earlier, we look away and we, we don't engage with one another. Not sure what boundaries are okay to step over, to hold someone accountable, and, or how even they might receive what we bring. None of these seem like good spaces either, do they? And all of these spaces breed a space that no one really wants to enter. And so we stay separate, coming together, but but careful of our relationships, careful to, to, to let people in too deep. And we exchange, how are you? And I'm fine, thank you for asking. And often that's as deep as we go. And as we talk here about it this morning, I assume that some of you might be thinking something similar to what I'm thinking and that this space isn't going to be what's best for us as a church body as we look to grow as a healthy body so that we can move and engage and impact and fulfill the mission that God's called us to. And that we wish we had these deeper relationships and that we trusted others to walk with us a little bit deeper. So so that when we would check in, we would know that the, the, the person who's, who's maybe raising something with us is, is actually doing it to lift us up. Calling us to correction when needed, or encouraging us to steps of greater faithfulness. Knowing because we trust them, because they trust us, that they're holding us accountable through care and respect as they walk through these spaces with us. And we know accountability is actually a helpful thing, yet it's something we still hesitate to take part in, either as an accountability giver or as accountability receiver. So how do we enter this space? And there's a, a number of spaces in our lives in which we can, can look at this idea of accountability. And the first one we're going to look at is just having an accountability partner. Being specific about it, intentional about it, inviting somebody into that space. And I have uh, accountability partners with my wellness plan. Uh, and my wellness plan is, is a plan that I put together, try to put together each year that it, it includes a faith growth aspect, uh, a physical health a uh, reading and, and uh, a learning segment of it. And um, my wife, Andrea, and friend Scott, who's actually here this morning, thanks for coming, <laughs> um, um, they're my accountability partners. And, and this year, as uh, I've fallen really far off <laughs> of my wellness plan, as, as I'm slow to recover here from this COVID thing in December, and I've fallen really far off. And, and Andrea and Scott, they, they both check in with me, knowing where I've been and knowing how far I've come. And they gently nudge me to, to keep taking the steps that they know I can take when I'm getting discouraged, and they know that I need to take. Am I meeting my goals? Nope. Am I too far behind to catch up? Yep. (laughs) Are they pounding me over the head with it because I'm falling behind or struggling? No. Are they encouraging me along the way and saying keep going? Yes. See, I think this is a misconception of this accountability piece. This that it's going to give someone the space or permission to, to beat me up with, with, with whatever I'm messing up in or the areas I've grown lazy with. But that's not the case, or at least it shouldn't be anyway. 
for having an accountability partner. So there's a, there's a bunch of examples uh, in the in the Bible, and we'll we'll list I'll list a few of them that give us healthy examples of of what these kinds of relations look look like. And so another way to look at this is through the lens of of mentorship. Okay, kind of similar, but maybe a little bit different. And we might have a mentor that is is more wise and full of life and life experience who just speaks into us and we just absorb everything we can from them. And then there's kind of this mutual men- mentorship space where we, we grow and we learn and we talk and we process and we learn from each other. Um, so there's some of those spaces together here in our examples of the Bible. In the Old Testament, we have uh, Elijah and Elisha, right? Uh, that's a pretty obvious one. We have Moses and Joshua, and then even Moses, uh, his, his father-in-law, Jethro, was, was a bit of a mentor to him in the way that he designed his leadership structure as he, he, he led the Israelites. And then in the New Testament, <clears throat> you can look at, at uh, well, we'll start with Jesus, uh, as he mentored uh, the disciples, right? That's a pretty obvious, uh, pretty solid example right there of, of mentoring. Um, and you could say he still mentors us today as we, we read his stories and, and his messages through the Bible and as he still guides us through, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, right? And then there's Paul and Barnabas, who they were actually a, a bit of a mutual mentorship. They were kind of peers, but they learned from one another. They pushed one another. They challenged one another at times. But they held deep respect and care for one another. And then Paul mentored Titus and Timothy, and Barnabas mentored John Mark, and he also mentored Timothy. So you can, if, if, if uh, you have one mentor, you can have more. You can be learning from more than one space as well. <clears throat> so mentors are a great space and tool to enter into this space of accountability with someone. As, as a mentor, how, it, it, it's, it's set up to help us grow, right? That's what a mentor does. To teach us new ideas, to, to build us up, and to not just, not just look past our weaknesses, but to challenge us to grow in those areas, to grow through those areas. So as you study these mentor relationships that you can find through, throughout the Bible, they weren't about an accountability that's used other people's faults against them or degraded, or berated an individual, or embarrassed them in front of a group, which I think is sometimes what we think might happen if we let someone walk too closely. But these relationships, they were built on a love for Christ, and a love for growing another person's faith in Christ. And then in a way that impacts who we are and what we think and what we say and in what we do. This is the way good behavior should come about, right? Through a deepening faith, through a deepening heart continually changed on new levels by the love of Christ. So with this as the goal, and and accountability was modeled in, in the way of growing someone up. And in these cases in the Bible, and then in our cases now, I think specifically this is important in the areas of a faith that's grounded in Jesus. In a safe space to ask questions that we might have about this, this whole, whole Christ thing. And as we grow in this faith, some of the areas that we might struggle with will also be addressed in a way that comes to know and show Christ. Here's a couple of passages to, to look at from the New Testament authors uh, that speak of this space, of, of holding one another up through accountability, but doing it in a way that grows, that, that strengthens and encourages, not in a way that's aggressive or, or finger-pointing or belittling, but in a gentle and love of Christ kind of way. Hebrews 3.13 But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Encouragement is a place to come about this accountability piece. 
come about it in a way that's encouraging. Hebrews uh, 10, 24, and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up anything, or not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the Lord's day that they're talking about. The day of the resurrection. And so here in this one again, we see uh, in, in verse 24, it said to spur one another on in love and good deeds. Right? Again, not belittling, but in love and good deeds. In 20, verse 25, he used the word encouraging again. Then we'll look at James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You don't want just anybody being your accountability partner, right? And and I think this is what James is getting at here. He's assuming that we're sharing what we're sharing with a person that's righteous, right? And when we do, we can take stuff to them knowing that they're not going to throw it back in our face, but they're going to lift us up in prayer for healing. And the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You've got somebody on your team, on your side, when you let these people in. And then Romans 15, 14. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. So this is a, at least for me anyway, when I think about sharing something with somebody, I wonder how they might use it against me. Or or I wonder if they're a safe place. Or or if they're going to turn stuff around or something, right? But Paul here says, like, we need to actually think about each other. Paul's convinced you yourselves are full of goodness. The people within this body are full of goodness, right? This is a safe space. And if you look around this room, knowing that we are filled with this goodness that comes from Christ, we can know that we together as a body, and, and, and if we come individually to somebody, that the person we're coming to is competent to instruct us to grow through whatever it is we might need to go through. And then Galatians 6, 1-2, to uh, this is the first part of what Seth read earlier, just a bit ago. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin... You who live by the Spirit should make them get up in front of everybody and confess it to the group. No. You who are led by the Spirit should pretend that everything is okay. You who are led by the Spirit, that's not what it says, right? You who are led by the Spirit should restore that person gently. We keep getting this restore peace throughout the last bunch of number of weeks. It keeps coming up, doesn't it? And we restore not by public humiliation, not by beating them over the head, but by lifting them up in prayer and by competently compassionately, gently lifting them up. Oh, I'm not done with this verse, sorry. (laughs) Uh, But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Be careful not to fall into the same space. And then verse 2, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill The law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? To love one another as Christ loved the church. When we carry each other's burdens, when we hold one another up, we fulfill the space that Christ calls us to. 
And you can see the thoughts of these verses, with the thoughts of these verses, the importance of being as a community that lifts each other up. Caring for our hurting parts like we talked about in week one. Doing the hard work to, to navigate conflict and tension as a body so it doesn't turn into a space of hurt and they don't, the tensions don't just pile up like we talked about last week. And now today, walking in the space of, of vulnerability and accountability because sometimes this accountability space and, and relationships like this are going to ask us to be vulnerable with one another. But to not become isolated. Not to put a spotlight on someone's struggles or mess ups, but to encourage one another to live in line with the call of the body, the call of Christ. And these scriptures call us to live in this space. And when we do, we can encourage and strengthen each other. And as we watch each other build our faiths, cutting out the, the the, the, the free, cutting free of the spaces that might pull us away from a deep faith. And watching those who, when approached with gentleness, know that the accountability that's being brought to them is to help them become more and not out of a space of harm or ridicule. And you can see how the ideas from last week can be useful as we approach uh, this space of accountability, right? This idea of, of, of seeing a growth area, a problem. We, we talked about this last week. That's not usually difficult for us to see, right? Other problem areas, either corporately or, or in other people, we see those things, right? But then knowing if you see something that you might now be part of the solution to help them grow through it. And then being willing to go and speak to that person. Not as a critical elitist. Not as someone who's, who's just throwing their stuff at them. But through these ideas of, of using the cord idea that we looked at last week. And, the, and we have the, the bulletin board in the back here. We brought it back out of the office. So if you want to see, get more into what that cord idea looks like, you can, you can take a look there. For those of you online, it's, it's uh, with our last week's sermon. You can click and there's a, a, a page there with it on there as well. But this cord idea is simply about being someone who wants what's best for our body. As individuals and as a greater church body, promoting a healthy faith <clears throat> out of a love for Christ. Christ. That will grow and it will mature. And it will enable the rest of the body to become something more than it currently is. And we become individual parts then that move with purpose and intention of the whole body connected with the Holy Spirit. So that we might together form a body and form a community that moves with the purpose and the intention of a body connected with the Holy Spirit. To move not for our own gain, but for a greater purpose. And to move in ways that we had never imagined as individuals and as a whole body of Christ. Now we might not all called to be, be a mentor. But I, I, I think we can all value and, and see the value in having a mentor, right? With entering into this space of being willing and, and wanting to learn from another person. And when we approach one another with this wanting to learn from each other, then we want, we're not going to get offended or resentful when someone calls us to a higher standard in, in our lives. But instead, we're open to receive teaching, to receive input on something that might grow us into something more connected with God than, than maybe we currently are. That's why we're here. We're here to grow. We're not just here to come and sit and call it good and go back to everything normal the rest of the week. And in turn, as we grow, this will lead us to healthier relationships 
with God, with Christ, with family, with the church, in our workspaces and schools. Accountability is a space that's, that's maybe gotten a bad rap out in the world. As it presses for this idea of individualism and, and, and questions the right of anyone to speak into a life or a call for, for a higher way of living or a better way of living. And it's seen as an abuse <laughs> that, some, that, 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 that someone would call somebody else, individuals or groups of people out. And unfortunately, those are the churches that often make the news highlights, right? Or the churches that are out there being loud and, and, and throwing other people's struggles back at them. But accountability isn't something that has been done in front of the world. Or even in front of a whole congregation. For other people to, to see or to use. But it's an important growth growth piece so that we know we aren't walking alone. So we don't become isolated. But we feel and know that we are part of a body and have a bigger connection that loves us just the way we are. But also loves us too much to let us stay where we are and wants us to grow to something more beautiful than we already are. For us as Jesus followers, this might be to keep us moving and connected to the Holy Spirit, to keep us from falling into the world's spirit. And this continues to pull on these strings of, of, of healthy community that we've been touching on it so far in this series. We can't afford to let church be a place that we can just come and hide. And a piece that we're going to get into a bit in a couple weeks is, is this idea that we, we have to only bring our best. Stay tuned for more on that one. But this community needs to be a safe space for us to navigate this accountability space in love. And because of Christ's love, we commit to hold one another accountable because we want one another to rest in the space of walking through life in a pure and blameless way. How wonderful will it be when we get to that day when life is short and we can look back and we can say, I navigated life in a pure and blameless way. Wouldn't that be beautiful? So we give accountability gently. And we receive accountability not that it might always feel good. <laughs> it might not. But we receive it because we know we want to grow for ourselves. And we want to be part of a community and a church body that loves one another enough to help rise us up. Is the community that you're part of helping you rise up? Or is it muddying waters, adding confusion to your life? Are the people that you're aligned with here on Sundays or, or out in the, in the world during the week, are they sources of input for your life that are aligned with the same spirit that we claim we try to follow here in the Holy Spirit? Or are they aligned with another spirit, spirit of the world? So whether we're, in, we're part of an official mentorship or not, I want you all to know that we have people watching us. We have people watching us, some from a, a close perspective, whether it's in the home, children, family, spouse. 
co-workers that we work close with, or others from a distance. People we meet at the grocery store or, or, or other people at work that we aren't working as closely with. But people are watching us. They're watching you. They're watching me as we navigate life. And as we, as we navigate faith, And it's likely that most of the people outside of the building that you connect with regularly, whether you've had the conversation with them or not, know that you are a person of faith, right? So they're watching you to see what that means. And they're watching how we navigate relationships. They're watching how we navigate turmoil or tension. People are learning from you how to move through life. They're learning from us what it means to be part of a faith community. They're learning from you how to handle the tough things like we saw last week from Paul. As he turned the tough things when he's he's in jail, right? He's in jail in chains. He's got guards all around him. And he turns it into an opportunity to share the gospel. And they're learning from you also how to celebrate the good things with one another. Praise team can come forward. And using what Paul said last week, when the people watching us, they see us navigate and lead our faith in this way, willing to hold one another up, and strengthen one another in our faith, and to turn the tough things and the good things all as spaces to share the gospel. Using and teaching and correcting. Then the people watching us will also gain confidence in who they are as Christ followers so that they too can do the same. They can be who they need to be as a follower of Christ. Or that they might want to come to you and know who this Christ is so that they too can respond to things in the way that you did. So they can be who they need to be in all situations, in all relationships. Tough and wonderful. As they turn both into a place to share the gospel. Amen. Would you stand and and sing with us as we close the service?
bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. As we continue to grow as a community, as a body of believers that's, that's not just confined by this building that doesn't move, as we continue to grow our health, our faithfulness in Christ, we can enter into this space that this, this song just led us through. And we can bring our stuff to the altar. We don't have to leave it outside the building. Did you know that? We can bring it here knowing that this body is going to care for us and lift us and walk with us gently, caringly. So that when we leave this space, we can go out into the world and ready to respond to the world in a way that's caring and gentle so that we might restore the world as we restore one another in here and as Christ restored us. We have the opportunity to restore the world to join this body. This is Christ's call for us. To love one another as He loved the church and to go out into the world and share your testimony. The testimony of Christ. Amen. You may be seated.